Thank you so much. Um, really, really nice to be here and be able to, to talk about this topic as well. Um, yeah, my name is Patrick Pax. I'm associate professor at the Game Design Department through Southern University. Um, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, playing Warhammer 40,000 um, in the comparison between the analog way of playing it and playing it in sort of more a digital version on tabletop simulator. Um, the idea is that I will give you a little bit of an overview of what the differences are and then uh, take a closer look in the analysis of uh, where the differences come from and what we can learn from that maybe more broadly for, for games um, and uh, also some sort of critical perspectives here. Um, yeah, so the aim is to compare these two ways of playing this game uh, and see what we can learn about the properties of analog and digital gaming, as well as about player participation and creating game communities and gaming culture. 40K has, it's, it's not at all a fringe game anymore. If, I mean, it has been dominant on the miniature gaming market already for a long time, and especially now during the pandemic, it has exploded in popularity uh, as well as uh, in financial results for a company that's producing it or producing a miniature games workshop. Um, it is growing a competitive scene and it's uh, gotten more and more visibility. Um, it has also gotten some attention in research. We have, for example, work that looks at miniature gaming as a pastime, so extending sort of the frame of just the miniatures or just the playing, but to a broader sort of hobby, just like many other activities as well, maybe unsurprisingly so. Um, looking at facets like crafting, collecting, role play, community, all of these sort of elements that are part of that. We have had uh, work on Degra that looked at line of sight, sort of the physicality of the models on the table in the way they are. The, the physical objects are um, related to actual rules and actual gameplay. Um, and uh, we have, uh, there, there's research about the role of dice and of luck and of chance and of building co-creative uh, co narratives of games, sort of collecting uh, the, the players on one side of the table and rolling out those few dice rolls that decide on the, the fate of this particular battle and sort of building that tension and resolving it together and, and, and laughing and crying and sort of these sort of emotional and, and narrative elements. And then we had uh, from uh, Wille, who's also here in chat and looking forward to his presentation, um, uh, the, the work around comparing digital and analog to Blood Bowl, which is a, a similar miniature game also produced by the same company, uh, and um, uh, yeah, pushing the, the envelope here already. So uh, there, there's definitely been work done before this that uh, this um, paper is standing on the shoulders of. Um, the analysis in this paper is also powered by and informed by the ways that these previous papers have been looking at uh, miniature gaming. So the analyt analytical frames that I've been taking to this analysis were looking at crafting and making, at the physicality of, of the uh, models in comparison between analog and digital, the social interaction, then competitive play, which is something that also comes from me because I have been engaging in the competitive side of gaming, at accessibility, um, uh, and then also looking at the digital interface and questions of participation. And the method for this analysis uh, so the, this is a fully published article, so you can, of course, read more there. It's autoethnographic play, so that means that I have been playing in communities. Um, uh, I've been playing both analog and digital uh, Warhammer 40,000 in competitive environments. I've been participating in uh, one or by now two bigger uh, Warhammer 40,000 analog events and a number of smaller one-day tournaments. And I have been playing over, I think, nearly two years with some breaks in summer and winter one competitive game a week on online tournaments, which are actually quite high caliber with uh, internationally sort of known uh, players and opponents who have been uh, putting me in my place. Um, but uh, collecting uh, diaries, collecting uh, screenshots with uh, consent from my opponents, in most are in all cases where I collected them, uh, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of trying to collect whatever is sort of the, the interesting elements of this because before I become too familiar so that I don't see them anymore. Uh, I will show you the game sort of a little bit more live in a few minutes, but this is sort of what, for example, a match from zoomed out perspective on tabletop simulator could be looking like. What we have here on the left side, for example, this is my army just uh, deployed here at the very edge. And here's my opponent uh, and he has some sort of long range artillery. So I sort of make these circles that measure this maximum shooting range and just stayed out of that in deployment. Here, uh, so this is, for example, the, just before the match starts. So now the next thing is we, we check out who gets first turn and then, and then it's uh, go time. Um, all right, so let's launch into the analysis of this. 
this. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an overview um, towards the end of the talk where you can see what the game looks like. And I think some things will fall into play a little bit better then. So the first element that is crafting and making that is very central to the physical game, that is where you are really assembling the miniatures, painting them, making them your own, maybe modifying them, um, this entire sort of crafting part of culture, that doesn't exist in the same way in the digital version. There is a possibility for making 3D models, for making maps, for doing these kind of things, but they do require uh, familiarity with digital tools. Um, it, is still, it is still possible to do that, and you can still make your things yours a little bit, but it doesn't exist in the same way. That also means that one big element of competitions, which is the, the best painted competition or this sort of crafting element, is really de-emphasized in, in, in competition. Everybody's models are, for the most part, downloaded from the same um, library of models where people can, can pick whatever they want to play. And really, this, this crafting and making element is, is uh, de-emphasized. This is a little bit sad as well. Right, like, uh, on, and it also on the one hand makes it easier to play, but it also takes away something. Like this is my favorite miniature that I own and, and painted. Um, so this is sort of the, the the best that I could achieve so far. And while it is tricky to get an army painted and ready uh, and and uh, ready to play, it is also nice. Like I mean, I'm, I am sort of quite emotionally attached to this little guy over here that I, that I painted up with this purple purple hair that is sort of uh, having its, its own own armor covering it. Uh, so, um, but yeah, that, that doesn't exist in the same way. So this is something that, that cannot quite be replicated, right? Instead, we have uh, miniatures that are, have been scanned in or been 3D modeled and created in various ways that can be picked up from big tables to make your armies and get them ready and can just use them to play. That, however, doesn't mean that there isn't any physicality of these models in the game. The elements like drawing line of sight and aiming over the shoulder, going down to the table and looking through the eyes of the miniature as it's put in previous literature, that still exists. And one does that on the table, like all the time. Um, other elements that change is that there's less stigma around touching models. In the analog game, it is basically a taboo to touch somebody else's models without permission uh, or without consent because they are valuable, they're fragile. Also, you shouldn't, of course, bump anything while the game is playing because it would change the game state. Um, but yes, you should never touch anything without, without asking first. So for example, when coming with kids to a tournament, that is like sort of the rules. That you, can, you, you cannot touch anybody else's toys without asking them first, which is kind of strange because they are toys, right? It's just adults' toys that they are very emotionally attached to. Um, so uh, there, there is this physicality of coming to the table and of looking over the, over the eyes. So here's like an artillery piece and I want to see, can I, can I shoot at these guys over there that are hiding between the walls? Or can I see these guys in the back? Oh yeah, I'm coming down and looking over its shoulders. Yes, line of sight is there. They are, but, uh, they are acceptable targets. The social interaction is also something that is still very much there. We still have this shared storytelling um, that is there when there's an important dice roll happening, for example. Um, if uh, it's really deciding the game whether or not I am getting this charge and uh, maybe able to, to take out my opponent's general or not, there's the same moment where both people come to the same side of the table and look at and drop the dice into the dice roller and see what the result is and have the same sort of emotional reaction. Oh yes, oh no, like this is like, it's, that, that is sort of still happening and that is very, very similar to the analog version. The spaces of course aren't quite the same. Then you meet on Discord servers um, and tournaments, online tournaments are often uh, meeting spaces around which everything's organized. So that's also where competitive pushes itself a little bit in but that is still there. And this is what this dice roller looks like. I explained that a little bit more in a paper, but it's an interesting tool to maintain some of the social uh, and sort of narrative building dynamics of rolling the dice. It doesn't give you just a readout, but you have the actual dice, drop them in the box and then see the result here. So that, that is an interesting way of designing this, I think, where we can learn something from to keep these, these analog moments of story uh, and, and narrative building, even in the digital world. Um, Competitive play is a very central element here, uh, partly because my data collection focused on that and my access to the community focused on that, but also because that is what, or, what a lot, lots of the community is organized around. That, of course, means that there are certain blind spots, for example, for narrative play, for more hobby engagement with that. But it also shows that the digital has a lot to offer here. 
there's a very, very easy possibility of just picking up new armies and miniatures and trying out new crazy builds that in reality you would have to play, pay hundreds of euros and spend hundreds of hours painting before ever getting the possibility to seriously try this on the table. This also means that the meta game is harsher because people will very, very quickly pivot to the strongest possible armies and put them on the table 10 minutes after a rule change, which is just impossible analog. Right? Um, and you have in these tables, for example, also rules documents that include the rules, the scoring, all of that already into the table as it's being built, which makes it much easier to play. Um, so the next element here that I would like to talk about is accessibility. I mentioned already that it's, it's not as possible to craft armies to, uh, to build and, and uh, create your miniatures like that. But that is also reducing the barrier to entry. It means that I don't need to, if I want to take an army to a tournament, make sure that every little soldier has the right weapon in their hand, or if they don't, break them off and put another. Um, there is a particular minimum standard that is both somewhat enforced in tournaments, to, that your uh, miniatures have to have three colors and be played, you know, uh, be based in order to be played. And that can be at least I experienced that as a lot of pressure to get that ready to be even able to participate. I, I have a job, I have family, I have children, like getting my army, my toy soldiers painted to the correct standard is from my perspective oftentimes experienced as some sort of gatekeeping and sometimes even bullying. Like there has been an event, for example, at a tournament where I was in a competitive game and somebody from another table came over and commented on one of, one of my miniatures not being quite, quite up to, to specs in terms of painting. And I was like, I mean, wasn't super throwing me off. It was just like, okay, wow, we're policing these. That is, that was a bit un, uh, unexpected for me. So that is happening. Um, the financial costs of getting an army uh, that is playable is at least four hundred euros. I would estimate for two thousand points of competitive army to put that on the table. And in PC games, uh, in, in the computer, it's free. You can download them you, if, as long as you can find them with some access. If you find a competitive server that will show them to you, you can get that, right? And I know what I'm talking about. I'm just turning around here. No, so here you can see my sort of issues with collecting too much plastic uh, on the on the screen here and my yeah, in my my picture uh, profile picture. So this is just one. Like this, this continues. You know, like this is get worse. So uh, um, yeah, it's it's still happening, but it's it's it requires energy and time. Um, but the most interesting part really for me as well was the interface. The interface of Tabletop Simulator includes elements that were, would otherwise be basically like cutting edge or in this case, this research is already 10 years old, but it's still trying to uh, implement um, so additional layers of technology into a Warhammer 40,000 game where a computer can see what's going on and um, help, help with, for example, measurements, know which miniatures are where. Uh, this interface basically uses um, elements like special augmented realities uh, that would otherwise be experimented with by using projectors or digital alternatives, right? This is a, a screenshot from uh, an experimental research table that has projectors on top that try to show uh, ranges of guns or movement or sort of patterns on the table. And this is something that um, Tabletop Simulator does as well without researchers or uh, in sort of uh, in insane budgets, um, just, just in a playable game. And this is what I like to, would like to show you here for a second. So I'm switching the screen that I'm sharing, putting you over here. Can you see the game? Yes, right, so this is what Tabletop Simulator looks like. Uh, here's the table, right? Uh, here's the scoring sheet that has all the rules. You can see that I mouse over and it can tell me what, it's, what, it's, what we're going to be doing, what gives me points, so lots of embedded information. Here's the battlefield that I loaded in. This is the one of them that we are using for the world's uh, team tournament. So this has been created by people who really know the rules. Mousing over will tell me exactly the categories of rules that is relevant for this container. It's nicely three-dimensional coming in down here. And here's my army that I made for, for, this, like, uh, for this round of the game. They also have a little warp gate that they can uh, put on the table and come out of. Right? Beautiful detailed miniatures. I like to put, uh, here we have some, some female version that is in this case a squad leader, so I think she's really cool. Um, and uh, these miniatures are accessible on the table. It's automatically 
by lifting them up and moving them, measuring the distances of how far they have moved. That's visible to me and my opponent to prevent cheating and make the game faster. It makes it possible to basically create these uh, areas. Let's see, she's the leader and she would like to have a, a range around her where she provides some sort of bonus for morale. So I can have a little circle around that. So now I can see exactly that, which would otherwise be achieved by a projector on an experimental researcher's table, which is not at all tech as normally exists. Um, we can, uh, I can mouse over these and see their rules, their stats, and even get a full breakdown of everything they are able to do in this. Connect them all and give them one color, and now they are uh, marked pink to see if they maintain coherency or if this one is too far out, then that color at least should, uh, should go away because then they are breaking coherency. I think I might have script, uh, scripted something wrong here. So it's a lot of really interesting elements that are already part of this here. If they get jumbled up, oh, no problem. Press the button, have them arranged in a way and set up again. So really amazing uh, interface elements that would otherwise be cutting edge uh, technology here already in the game. So switching back to uh, PowerPoint. Um, so, and I think that is really an, an interesting element here. And this is done and it's possible because there's a linking up of infrastructure from a lot of different spaces that is all player made. Battlescribe, an app in my phone that I use to make my army and sort of pick what I want to have in it, gets, and this is, a, this is just an app that allows these sort of files to become visible, but all the files in the background are player created, added by players, maintained by players. The new rules come out very quickly updated. These can be with a piece of infrastructure that is created by, you guessed it, a player, be loaded up. Now here we have already the, the stats for my leaders from my next army and loaded up into the game. I can find all the miniatures that are relevant uh, over um, the relevant Discord server on the Battleforge that brings me to um, uh, depositories where I can download all the files, beautifully rendered uh, 3D models of new released, uh, in a, uh, new released uh, miniatures that have just come out already available just days after, and then inscribe in the way that you saw the rules onto them on the table to create all of these effects that would otherwise go beyond what research could be doing on experimental. A projector or a digitally enabled tables. So my conclusion here from this study, and there's basically twofold. First of all, the digital game is defined by networked player creativity. The thing that really changes what this game is, is that players can band together, fuse in this sort of interesting assemblage of technologies and platforms, um, their creativity, their, uh, info, uh, their, their abilities together and make something new. So really, the, the creating participatory creation of culture and the differences between analog and digital are the same here. That is what is the, the big difference. Right? It's possible to make uh, to play this game and put an army together within minutes, which is completely impossible in the analog, uh, analog play. And the innovation, these innovative tools come from player creators. Accessibility is especially from a critical perspective, not really part of work around miniature games as much as I would like it to be. So the financial and crafting limitations, from my perspective, are somewhat underreported or sometimes even hardly managed and mentioned in previous work. There are elements that I think should come up, like shaming players who have ugly miniatures, the notion of the pile of shame, which is all my unpainted plastic. Uh, like this is sort of a really sort of pervasive notion the questions of plastic addiction, where people just buy too much, power creep, we know all that, like uh, the company really singing miniatures, and even questions of lifestyle gains and exploitation, where the rules updates are so frequent that people have to spend their entire time keeping up with them in order to be able to play, locking them out of maybe other activities or sort of uh, maintaining this as the core game in this space instead of other maybe more interesting and participatory cases. So in summary, when playing 40,000 or Warhammer 40k on tabletop simulator, the player community and participatory design, that is what makes YouTube's battle ready. That's what makes this game function here. The difference between the analog and the digital is the digital information networks on the one hand, but also that they are still somewhat free for the players to make their own game. And that is not because Games Workshop allows that. They have been trying to cut down and come down on this. Uh, that's also what makes the 
makes it harder to play the game because the yeah, players need to hide their files so that they cannot be taken down um, by, by lawyers. Um, yeah, more to the point, games can be awesome when they are set free. The death through the rights management along with the players. Yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, Patrick. I am coming to you to ask questions. So we have questions on maybe you could come up and I'll stop. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for looking into this. This is uh, I found this really really interesting, and this kind of comparison was uh, well very much due. I think um, I'm curious if you've noticed any like playing for the K on TTS. Uh, obviously, like you say, introduces many other contextual elements. Um, do you notice like a shift in the? culture around playing Warhammer 40k, is this the same people just shifting their games on TTS or does it, has it opened up for a new kind of player who only plays on, on TTS given the accessibility uh, elements that you just, just mentioned? Uh, excellent question, thank you. I'll just have a little bit closer to you. Um, uh, I think it's partly both. Some of the communities, the competitive communities are basically or ex started as extensions or continuations of the competitive communities to keep existing during Corona, right? So I think that was one thing that really sort of made them explode in size. But that's not the only thing. Many people realized, that, wow, this is a possibility and then stayed that way. Um, as an example, right, we have the, the, the Copenhagen uh, competitive community is quite big in the North here. And now they run this ongoing tournament circuit. And I think now it's the 15th or 16th tournament in a row with one game a week, four games in a tournament. So every month is basically a new tournament. I played in the last few. My son, 13, also played in the last one. He finished on Monday a game against a Singaporean businessman, right? I mean, that, that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And these sort of affordances aren't going to go away because now we can meet again. Because they are awesome and people stick with them. So it started based in the existing competitive community, but now it's become its own thing and it's become something. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions in the room or on the chat or online? Yes. Um, hello, thank you for the presentation. I just have a question like, well, why in your, because all of it seems too, too good to be true. Um, and why, in your opinion, do you think Games Workshop doesn't capitalize on that and doesn't make like, their own virtual tabletop Warhammer with, you know, our DLCs for armies and so on, so, so they could make money, uh, however the, the, the gamers will, will, will play their game. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's about it. Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Um... I think uh, for the most part, Games Workshop is trying to become a company that is extending its, its IP into these sort of digital spaces as well. I think they're making a bit to become some sort of platform for, um, uh, for board gaming or miniature gaming with their subscriptions and things like that. But that is sort of the more dystopian platform capitalism talk right? that, that I didn't want to deliver here. Uh, but uh, I think for the most part, it's just that they can't do it. Um, because player creators networked and, and come together are just better. Even basic battle scribe, right? The first step in this connection and assemblage of player created infrastructures is way better than the uh, app that Games Workshop is pushing us trying to do the same thing, even though they have direct first access to the rules, they just can't make it work. It's sort of notoriously horrible. So, yeah. Players collectively are just better. Thank you so much. We've got a question from Bree. Uh, great talk, uh, Patrick. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on what the future of Warhammer 40K will be like? Do you think there will ever be a point in time where it will go fully digital? Or do you think it's always going to sort of exist in this hybrid kind of model i think the uh i think the digital and the analog will hopefully stay parallel next to each other i think the analog is always going to exist 
because while the digital offers some elements of sociability, it's still not quite the same as meeting a friend and, you know, having a beer afterwards or whatever your pre preferred beverage, maybe, you know, like, uh, so it doesn't quite replace that. Um, but I, I hope that it continues to go and keep existing in parallel. It is now for many people training for competitive play, but it's also making it possible to continue playing over distances, right? Uh, in the same way in which I think that people will come together to play Dungeons and Dragons because it's nice. Well, if you're locked up or if you play with your friends far away, then over Zoom will also be nice. You know, it's like it's not quite the same thing, but it's also valid. Um, for the future, I hope that the fights around ways of internalizing profit and, and shutting down uh, player created contents will not destroy the space because we've seen too much of that happening in other spaces. And I hope that won't be the case. Thank you so much for your excellent question. No, thanks for that answer. Thank you. Let's finish. And now yeah. Super quick to PS, Berge. I'm, uh, yeah, magic, an amazing community, an amazing comparison. Uh, and what happened to uh, Commander as the player created amazing new way of playing the game where the players again beat the game designers at their own game. But then Wizards of the Coast comes and says, oh, now I print Commander cards and you can do anything because we have this power. It's really sort of a warning example. I think and we should we should take more look more at that and, and write about that. So excellent point. Thank you so much. Thank you.